In 1939, the coal-fired steam engine ruled America. 98% of rail horsepower, untouchable and backed by giants who owned the tracks, the mines, and even Washington's ear. Yet behind closed doors, General Motors risked everything to build a machine no one wanted and many said was illegal. It was not just a technical gamble, it was a declaration of war on an entire industry. In less than a year, a secret prototype would expose steam as fragile, obsolete, and beatable. How did the world's mightiest technology lose its crown almost overnight, and why did so many try to bury that story? To answer that, we have to start with the unbreakable fortress of steam. Steam locomotives in 1939 were the backbone of American freight, but their strength came at a staggering cost. Every mile of track felt like a battlefield between physics and brute force. A typical mainline steam engine spent nearly half its life out of service, 30 to 50% of the time locked away in the shop for repairs, inspections, or waiting for its next overhaul. For every two days on the road, a steam locomotive might spend another day sidelined. The design itself was a compromise with violence. Reciprocating rods and massive pistons slammed up and down with every revolution, hammering the rails with what engineers called hammer blow. That force meant torn up track, endless maintenance along the right of way, and a cycle of wear that punished both machine and infrastructure. Railroads poured money into heavier rails and constant repairs to keep up with the pounding. Water was another relentless enemy. A big freight steamer could swallow 5,000 to 10,000 gallons of water every 100 miles. That meant stops every 50 to 70 miles, no matter the schedule. Towers dotted the landscape, and crews learned to work filthy, soaked, and exhausted. Ash, cinders, and coal dust coated everything. The men who ran these engines wore the grime as a badge of honor, but the cost was measured in hours lost and resources burned. Efficiency was an illusion. For all their spectacle, steam engines wasted energy at every turn. They needed two, sometimes three crew members just to keep the fire burning and the machine moving. Every start was a gamble. Too much throttle and the wheels spun helplessly. Too little and the train stalled on the grade. When conditions turned bad, the answer was always the same. Add another engine, add another helper, add more men. The entire system was built to serve the needs of steam, not the other way around. Roundhouses, water towers, coal docks, and armies of mechanics kept the wheels turning. For the railroads, this was normal. For the coal industry, it was profit. For the men in charge, it was tradition. But beneath the soot and noise, the numbers told a different story. Half the fleet was always down, the tracks were always battered, and every mile was paid for in sweat, steel, and waste. No one in power wanted to hear it, but the fortress of steam was already showing cracks. In the boardrooms and offices that ran America's railroads, steam was not just a machine, it was a way of life. The men at the top called themselves steam men. They wore their experience like armor, built on decades of coal-fired power and blackened hands. Most had spent their careers specifying, buying, or even designing steam locomotives. To them, the idea of a diesel pulling real freight was not just laughable, it was an insult. Trade journals in 1939 carried their words. Diesel is a toy for streamliners. You cannot trust oil to move the nation's freight. The prejudice ran deep, reinforced by the numbers on every balance sheet. The real engine behind steam's dominance was not just tradition, it was coal. Many railroads did not just haul coal, they owned the mines. Coal contracts stretched for decades, signed by executives who sat on both railroad and mining boards. Annual reports listed coal subsidiaries as key assets. Every ton shoveled into a firebox meant money moving from one pocket to another. The coal lobby and the railroads were tangled together, sharing directors, legal teams, and even advertising budgets. Steam's inefficiency was someone else's profit. The more coal burned, the better for everyone at the top. The infrastructure itself was a monument to this alliance. 
Roundhouses, water towers, ash pits, and coal docks covered the country. Railroads had invested millions in facilities built to feed, clean, and repair steam engines. Every mile of track, every yard of siding, every maintenance crew existed to serve the needs of coal-fired iron. Changing to diesel threatened to make all of it obsolete. For the men in charge, that was unthinkable. It was not just about technology, it was about protecting an empire. Even as the numbers turned against them, shop hours, fuel costs, wasted water, leadership clung to steam. They dismissed diesel as a fad, a marketing stunt, a gamble for lightweight passenger trains. Freight was serious business, and only steam was tough enough for the load. The trade press echoed this certainty, printing editorials about the unmatched reliability of the American steam locomotive. Behind closed doors, the real fear was clear. Diesel did not just threaten engines, it threatened livelihoods, investments, and the entire hierarchy of power that had ruled the rails for generations. Inside this fortress of coal and steel, any challenger would have to do more than run cleaner or cheaper. It would have to break through a wall built from pride, money, and decades of mutual interest. That is why what happened next was not just an engineering contest. It was a direct attack on the heart of the old order. Richard Dilworth was not interested in building another novelty. He wanted a machine that could go head-to-head -head with steam in the only arena that mattered, freight. The answer was the EMD 567 engine, a 16-cylinder two-stroke diesel designed from the first bolt for railroad punishment. It was compact, but each unit delivered 1,350 horsepower, and the modular power assemblies meant that a mechanic could swap out a cylinder in under an hour, no more sending engines to the back shop for days at a time. The 567 was built to run hard, day after day, without flinching. But horsepower alone would not win the war. Steam engines put their muscle through a few massive driving wheels and every piston stroke hammered the rails. The FT's trucks were different. Each unit rode on BB trucks, two sets of two powered axles. That meant all eight wheels on a unit dug into the rail at once, spreading the weight and gripping the steel. The result was adhesion that steam could not touch. On paper, the numbers looked almost suspicious. A four-unit set, 5,400 horsepower, nearly 900,000 pounds. But with a starting tractive effort that could rip couplers apart if the engineer was not careful. Crews used to slipping wheels on a rainy grade found themselves breaking trains instead, until they learned to respect the grip. The real secret weapon was hiding in the wiring. Multiple unit control, called MU, let a single engineer in the lead cab control every throttle, every brake, every power setting across all four units. Steam required a crew for every engine in a lash-up, plus helpers on the toughest hills. With the FT, one crew could handle the whole consist, no matter how many units were strung together. That changed everything. Railroads could move more tonnage with fewer men, fewer stops, and less drama. The FT was not just a locomotive, it was a system designed to run long, run hard, and run lean. Dilworth and his team did not just build a new engine, they built a new playbook. The streamlined car body, the so-called bulldog nose, was not just for looks. It cut wind resistance, protected the machinery, and made the FT look like something from the future, a shot across the bow of every coal black steamer in America. Internally, every detail was about reliability and speed of repair. Walkways sheltered from weather, equipment arranged for quick access, wiring harnesses that could be swapped as a unit. The FT was engineered for war, even before anyone knew how soon that war would come. This was not a science project. General Motors paid for the entire demonstrator out of pocket, with no customer lined up, no guarantees. If the FT failed, Dilworth's team would have nothing to show but a pile of expensive scrap. But if it worked, the old order was finished. The FT was ready to do what no diesel had dared, take on the heaviest freight in America, and win. General Motors' gamble did not stop at horsepower or glossy streamlining. The real subversion was buried in the fine print and on the shop floor, in accounting ledgers and clever mechanical workarounds. 
The FT Demonstrator was not a single locomotive. It was four units, two with cabs and two cabless boosters, locked together with heavy steel drawbars so they behaved as one machine. On paper, that made them inseparable, legally one machine. In practice, it was a calculated dodge around the labor rules. Labor contracts of the day were written for steam. One engine, one crew. If a railroad ran two or three engines on the front of a train, each engine needed its own engineer and its own fireman, every mile and every shift. That made labor costs balloon and kept dieselization in check. The AB drawbar trick let General Motors sell what was functionally two locomotives as a single unit, sidestepping the Brotherhood's definition of a locomotive entirely. The union saw a threat. Company lawyers called it creative compliance. Inside Electromotive Division, EMD, the stakes rose fast. There was no customer order and no railroad underwriting the risk. General Motors paid for every bolt, every hour of overtime, every test run. The FT Demonstrator was a $1 million bet with no safety net. If the machine failed, the loss was General Motors alone. If unions or regulators found a reason to block the drawbar ploy, that investment would turn to junk overnight. All of this unfolded as Washington's shadow crept closer. With war looming in Europe, the government prepared to freeze new designs and ration steel. The War Production Board's directives were clear. No more experiments, no more non-standard locomotives. Factories were told to stick to what worked to avoid tying up precious resources on unproven technology. General Motors' internal memos grew tense. Whispers ran through the plant that the window for innovation was closing fast. The FT demonstrator had to prove itself before the moratorium hit, or federal order would shut the project down. Every day in the LaGrange plant felt like a countdown. Engineers worked double shifts and managers signed off on overtime without blinking. The factory floor buzzed with the urgency of a covert operation. The FT build date, November 1939, became the line in the sand. If the locomotive was not on the rails and in public view before the government freeze took effect, it might never be allowed to run at all. The pressure was technical, legal, financial, and existential. The drawbar configuration was a chess move against the unions and also a shield against regulatory interference. By presenting the FT set as a single, indivisible locomotive, General Motors forced labor negotiators and government officials to confront a new reality. The rules of the steam era no longer applied. The demonstrator's fate would hinge not just on engineering, but on whether General Motors could outmaneuver the old guard before the door slammed shut. With the clock ticking, the FT number 103 rolled out of LaGrange under its own power, painted deep green with yellow stripes. There was no fanfare and no press release. The prototype was on the move, carrying the hopes of its creators and the full weight of that wager. From that moment, every mile counted, not just for the machine, but for the future of American railroading. November 1939 The FT number 103 rolled out of LaGrange and did not look back. There was no press conference, no ribbon cutting, just a cold start and a hard schedule. The mission was simple. Put this unproven diesel on the rails of every major freight carrier in America. The plan was ruthless. Show up at the yard office, hand over the green machine, and throw down the gauntlet. Give us your heaviest train, the one your best steam engine struggles to move. This was a secret move. It was not just a test run, it was a nationwide dare. The FT would cover more than 83,000 miles in less than a year, crossing 35 states and running on at least 20 different railroads. Names like Santa Fe, Baltimore, and Ohio, Great Northern, Southern, and Western Pacific all took their turn. Some roads handed the FT their most punishing freights, coal drags, mountain manifests, long strings of loaded hoppers. Others ran it in regular service, treating it as just another engine and waiting for it to fail. The crew assigned to number 103 became a traveling hit squad. They lived out of suitcases, riding the rails from division to division, sleeping in cabooses and cheap hotels, logging every mile and every problem. There was no time for breakdowns. If something broke, it got fixed in the field, side of the track repairs, parts swapped in the dark, no shop days. The FT had to run, 
or the whole campaign was dead. Every arrival was an ambush. Steam men lined up to watch, arms folded, waiting for the diesel to slip, stall, or burn out its motors. Instead, the FT kept moving. It pulled tonnage that should have required double-headed steam. It skipped water stops. The crew wore clean coveralls, not sweat-soaked denim. By the time word spread down the line, the FT was already gone, off to the next railroad, the next challenge, the next set of skeptics. The tour was not just a demonstration, it was a rolling challenge to the entire steam establishment, and it was only getting started. On the western slopes, the railroad's toughest grade waited, a test that had broken the pride of more than one steam crew. The ruling grade stretched for miles, twisting up through mountain curves where the rails gleamed with the scars of failed ascents. Standard practice called for double-headed steam, sometimes a helper cut in behind the caboose just to keep the tonnage moving. Crews braced for the usual, wheels slipping, firemen shoveling harder, the train lurching to a crawl, or worse, stalling in the middle of nowhere. But this time, the FT demonstrator lined up alone. Four units, 5,400 horsepower, a single crew in a clean cab. The engineer eased open the throttle, and the train started up the grade with a steadiness that made old hands uneasy. No pounding, no hammer blow, just the steady growl of 16 cylinders and the hum of electric traction motors. The tonnage behind was real, enough to make a 2102 sweat, but the FT dug in, every axle gripping, every wheel putting power to the rail. Mile after mile, it climbed without a helper, never breaking stride, never once slipping. At the summit, where steam engines would be stopped for water and a breather, the FT kept rolling. The descent was where the magic happened. Instead of riding the air brakes and praying the shoes did not overheat, the engineer flipped a switch. The traction motors flipped their roll, now acting as generators, turning the train's weight into electric resistance. The dynamic brakes howled, but the wheels stayed cool. The train held its speed, steady and controlled. No smoke, no drama. A veteran steam chief watched from the siding, arms folded, face unreadable. When the train reached the bottom, he finally spoke. He said, I have never seen anything like it. That is not railroading. That is sorcery. The verdict was in, and everyone who mattered had seen it. The FT had not just matched steam on the hill, it had changed the rules of the game. The mountain, once the great equalizer, had just picked a new winner. Today, nearly every freight train in North America runs on diesel, a legacy that began the moment innovation collided with tradition. As climate targets push railroads to reinvent again, the lesson endures. Entrenched giants fall not from age, but from disruptive ideas. The next revolution is already waiting on the tracks. What change do you think railroads need most? Let's talk in the comments.